Hello, Southridge Church Online. We are so excited that you chose to join us today. Um, it's been a long time since I've been in this position here, and I really wish I could see your face. And um, I'm just glad that you're here with us today. We are jumping into a new series um, for the next few weeks, and it's called Hard Sayings. Um, we're going to look at some of the more difficult teachings or sayings that Jesus Jesus had. It's always, um, today's world, we always want to be in those feel-good moments, and the truth is often subject to our likes and our dislikes, but we know um, that the Bible is full of truths that Jesus said and those things that we need to hear so that we could be set free, right? Because Jesus is the truth, and he sets us free, and he speaks the truth. So even though they're hard sayings, we're going to embrace them, this next whole series, and see what God has in store for us. Would you pray with me real quick before we jump into some scripture? Father, we just thank you that um, your word is true. We thank you that uh, it's perfect and it's right. And we just ask that, God, as we go through this message this morning with the hard sayings that we find in the word of God, that you would, you would cause our hearts to be teachable and that you would cause us to be able to embrace what maybe you want us to learn today that would change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So gonna, I'm going to jump right in with our uh, key text, and it is, it is found in Matthew 7, 14. And this is what it says. It says, but the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few will ever find it. Ouch. Can you say that? Ouch. That, that sounds hard, but if you've ever been in a place that is difficult, um, you can relate with this in a sense, right? So I've done some difficult things. Uh, the, gro- the road of grief for me was a difficult road, and maybe you, you're in a place now that you're in on the road of grief, and, it, and it's difficult. That's, that's very true. It's difficult. I, uh, one time we went on a mission trip to Jamaica, and the road up to this orphanage was like this kind of a road. Like I had to shut my eyes the whole time because the road was difficult. I would have never wanted to drive it. I ran a, a marathon and training for the marathon and running the marathon. That was difficult. I've had to have difficult conversations with people and people have had to have difficult conversations with me. So the word difficult isn't really um, foreign in our, in our vocabulary, right? But, but the scripture, the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult. We don't always like to think that with our Christian faith. We like to think it's going to be a bed of roses and very easy, but that's not the case. And we're going to talk about that, that today. Um, and then, then there's a verse in John 6, 60 that says, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And this This verse is coming, if you want to jump into a good text of scripture, it's in John 6. The whole whole chapter is really good. And this is right after Jesus was telling his disciples, I am the bread of life. And they were, throughout chapter 6, they grumbled and complained about stuff a lot. But but they said, like, who who can accept this, this idea that this teaching that you have? So isn't that true for you and me today? We often avoid the hard sayings of Jesus. Um, because they make us feel uncomfortable. We don't like them. We, we embrace a lot of the scripture, but then there's certain parts that we don't want to embrace. And I actually heard of a, of a gal that took a black marker, and in the scripture verses that she didn't like, she just crossed them out with a black marker. I hope you don't do that. I hope you got your yellow highlight out and you're challenged by maybe some of the difficult scriptures we're going we're gonna to talk about. Um, Jesus said some hard stuff, and he didn't pull any punches because he knew what was on the line. He knew um, some of the hard things that we were going to face and some of the hard things that we needed to hear. So the hard sayings of Jesus were going to come face to face with some of the truths that he wants, wants us to know. So there's a saying about Jesus, and it goes like this. He comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. I like the first part. I like that he comforts me when I'm afflicted. You probably do too, right? But the second part, that he afflicts the comfortable, what? Why would he do that? And I think it's because he he realizes that there's more in store for us than what we know and feel right here today. 
So it's really for our benefit and his great love for us that when we're comfortable, when we're lackadaisical, when we get lazy, comfortable, things are just easy peasy and we don't really consider much of him, he'll kind of rock the boat for us. He afflicts us a little bit because he does care for us. He wants us to stay steady, be strong, and remain dependent upon him as we continue in our faith journey. So it's kind of like you and I might do when we have kids. Sometimes we have to speak the truth to our kids. Sometimes, even as little toddlers, we have to say, you know what I'm going to say, right? No, don't touch that. No, don't do that. And even as they get older, we have to tell them the truth like, hey, you know these choices are going to lead you down a road. And it's similar to what Jesus does to us when he has hard sayings. It's out of a heart of a love of a father that he does that for us. So we're going to jump into, we have one text that's going to be for each week. And this is the text for this week, and it, it's found in Matthew 5, 10 through 12. It's pretty long, but I think you're familiar with it. So the first part of it says, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. And, or otherwise, it's known as righteousness sake. In another version, it would say it's, it's not for our own stupidity or fanaticism, but, but rather for their faithfulness in Jesus, right? It's not, we're not doing right because we're stupid. We're doing right because it's the right thing for Jesus. And it says, for, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you. Disappoint your hopes is a definition of mocking. And persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. And evil things they say against us. Persecution, Jesus is saying that that persecution is not just physical, but it's also, he identifies, it can be verbal. It can be that things that people are saying about you, spoken in malice or bringing insults because you're a follower of Christ. And then it says in verse 12, it says, be happy about it. What? Be happy about it? Be happy that people are doing this? Yeah, be happy. Be very glad, it says, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Um, so the big idea for us today is that most of us would think being mocked and being attacked verbally is not a good thing. But Jesus is saying just the opposite. He's saying, be happy about it. Be happy when you are attacked. That sounds foreign, doesn't it? It does sound foreign. But this is, this is why you and I are, are different than the world around us. So the verses that precede this very text of scripture we're talking about are called the Beatitudes. And these are the, the blessed are statements, and they're character traits that describe the Beatitudes are not, not common, they're not popular in our culture today. But we, and we wouldn't recognize or actually give rewards for it. Like, could you imagine that you'd get the reward that says the most pure in heart award? They don't give that out of school. They don't give out the award that says the most poor in spirit. No, it's always the fastest, the smart. But that's what Jesus is acknowledging as being great. Though our culture doesn't think much of these character traits, they do describe the character of the citizens of God's kingdom. So we're in good company when we face those things. And then the king, Jesus, adds this eighth beatitude that we're talking about today. For those that, because of their loyalty to him, endure suffering. So how do these wonderful characteristics the meek, the pure in in heart, the peacemakers, bring about the persecution that we're going to talk about today. John 15, 19 really describes it really well. And it says, the world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. Right? Right? I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. So that's why the persecution comes because we're not part of the world. We're not seeking to be persecuted. We don't ask to be persecuted, but rather we shouldn't be surprised by it. And we should actually consider it a a blessing. Check out this verse in in Luke 6, 22. And and it's in the message version just because it's, it's really worded hilariously. It says, count yourself blessed. Every time someone cuts you down or throws you out, Every time someone smears or blackens your name to discredit me, what it means is that the truth is too close for comfort 
and that that person is uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Skip like a lamb, if you like. For even though they don't like it, I do. And all of heaven applauds. And know that you are in good company, and my, my preachers and witnesses have always been treated like this. Basically, it's not uncommon. So we're not only are we going to be happy when we're attacked, we're going to skip like a lamb. Can you picture that? I'd ask you if you could get up in your living room, kitchen, wherever you're at, and just skip around like a lamb. How does it feel? just feels good to skip like a lamb, all right? So don't be fearful. Don't be afraid of persecution. So living as a follower of Jesus can be difficult. And Jesus doesn't promise us unbound wealth or health. He doesn't. He does promise us blessings, though. And sometimes these blessings will be experienced through the pain of rejection and loss. In half of the chapters of Acts, it's all about being in jail and experiencing intense pressure for their faith. So what's it mean to be, to be blessed by God in the midst of persecution? Our text says, God blesses those who are persecuted. God blesses you when people mock you. The word blessed um, is derivative from the Greek word, the Greek term, makarios, which means fortunate, happy, enlarged, or lengthy. Blessed can also be, be described as or translated as favor. To live like this means you're going to stand out from the crowd. You're going to have a target on your back. You're going to be different. So if we live God- godly life, suffering's going to come. Persecution can be kind of a compliment of sorts. So you could say to your friends that are being persecuted for their faith or set aside for their faith or made fun of for their faith, wow, you look very pure- persecuted today. You know, and say you look great. You could, I'm just saying, you could try it, maybe. Maybe somebody would try it on you. So how do we truly rejoice and be happy or skip like a lamb when I'm being persecuted, mocked, lied, lied about, and accused? How do I maintain my happy and how do I skip like a lamb? So three quick little points on that. The first one is happy comes when we do the right, when we do the right things as a follower of Christ. So righteousness sake, we're going to do what's right when we follow Christ. God blesses us for doing right. Second Timothy says, because I preach this good news, I am also suffering and have been chained like a criminal, but the word of God cannot be chained. So I am willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory to Christ Jesus, to those who God has chosen. I mean, wrap your mind around that for just a quick second. It, It really looks different than the life that you and I lead, probably most often as Christians. We're not really willing to be persecuted. We we more often want to blend in with a crowd, but God tells us we should expect to suffer. Um, We know we should suffer for doing wrong things, but Jesus is telling us here that we might suffer for doing the right things. It doesn't seem to make sense. Jesus tells us we will be persecuted. There are so many scriptures that talk about being persecuted. If I'm choosing to do the right things, the righteous things, I'm being courageous rather than cowardly. And three, three things quickly on right. There's a right perception that you and I need to have as followers of Christ. We need to, we need to realize that I'm not a victim. I can walk victoriously. A lot of times I hear Christians, woe is me because they're made fun of. There's woe is me because I'm not in the in crowd. No, don't woe yourself. You're a victor. Walk victoriously. This is to be expected of the world that we live in. We have to have a big picture instead of a small small slide. It's not my ways, it's his ways. I will be the salt and the light of this world if I hang on to Jesus and do the right thing. The second right is we need to have the right heart. We need to have a heart that's open, that's teachable, that's loving in spite of mistreatment. We need to be faithful and obedient, reminding ourselves with our hearts, God, you're yet in control no matter what anybody is saying about me, no matter what anybody is doing to me, because I'm walking according to your ways and not my own. The third right is that we have to have the right response. So when we're faced with persecution, when we're faced with opposition, not because we're doing bad, but because we're standing up for our faith or walking in light of our faith, we have to have the right response. And the right response isn't revenge. 
The right response is letting God have the reins and the control so that he can be glorified through it. Okay, so there's a story of, a, of Peter in the Bible, and maybe you've heard it. And Peter, Peter was, a, was one of Jesus' disciples, and, and, and he loved the Lord, and the Lord loved him. Well, Jesus told him, you're going to deny me. You're going you're gonna to face some persecution, some opposition, and you're going to deny me. And Peter was like, heck to the no, I'm not. How many times have you said that to the Lord? You bring it on, God. I'm going to stand bold for you. And then you're at work and somebody says something about it. You just kind of, Peter did it three times. But I got good news for you. Jesus didn't lay him aside. Jesus still used him after that. So if you feel like maybe you've disappointed the Lord by not standing up, not being brave, don't sit on the sideline anymore. Know that God can still and will use you, just like he did Peter. Okay, the second, the second happy. The first happy comes because we are, we are willing to, to live right. The second, the second happy comes from understanding the reward. And Philippians 1.14 says, And because of my imprisonment, and most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. So he was in prison, and it gave everybody else confidence that he could stand up for what was right. Know that your reward could be that. It could be what somebody else's life is going to be changed because you stay faithful in the midst of persecution or opposition. We're not playing for for earthly popularity. That's not what we're playing this game for, living this life for. My eyes are heavenly focused, and I'm looking at life through God's view. I'm here at earth. And there's times that persecution is going to reward us with open doors. Look at what happened with the story of Joseph. You know, in the Old Testament, the the boy Joseph grew up, right? And he faced opposition after opposition, ended up in jail. And through all of that, the Egyptians and the Jews would have died of starvation. But that wasn't the end of what God had for him. So if you're facing persecution and you feel on the outside that God isn't getting you through, hang on. He may be working things on the other end, that's going to come out later. And, and same with the jailer. When Paul was in jail, um, Paul and Silas were there. They could have sat in there and they could have grumbled and complained and been mad about it, but they didn't. They didn't do that. You know what they did? They sang praises to God and the jailer and his family got saved, became Christians because of that. So never limit what God wants to do, what the reward's going to be. It could be on this side of eternity. The open doors that can happen on this side of eternity as a result of persecution, are tremendous. But nothing will equal the reward that we have when we stand before our Father in heaven. Nothing. And hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. On Tessa, our daughter's headstone, we had this Max Max Lucado, Max Lucado, there you go, um, quote, put on her headstone. And this is what it says. It says, before you know it, you'll enter the city and you'll hear your name spoken by those who love you, the city be in heaven, by those you love you, and maybe, just maybe, in the back, behind the crowds, the one who would rather die than live without you will remove his hand-pierced hands from his heavenly robe and applaud. Is that powerful to think about? Like, that's our reward, guys. We, we, we got to stay steady. We got to Face opposition with a heavenly mind to think that one day we'll enter into the city and our Lord would applaud that we're there? Yes, yes, we have to stay faithful. That, my friend, is the reward, the ultimate reward. The last happy, happy happy comes from the right choice, happy happy comes from the reward that we're going to get, and happy comes when we remember what we're part of. This is not our home. I'm going to read a scripture that's not up on the screen for you, and it comes from 2 Corinthians 5.1. And it says, For we know that this earthly tent we live in is taken down. That is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself, not by human hands. So we're in good company. We know that, that this earthly temple that we live in, this earthly life, is short lived. And we've got to remember that it's bigger than what we see here and now, what we experience here and now. We're in good company. We have to remember that part of a worldwide family of believers with a father who genuinely loves us. You're not alone in your faith. It's not just you against the whole world. 
you have a lot of people that have gone before you. There are those have, that have suffered tremendous persecution that have gone before us, tremendous. Um, the Bible's full of great men. The Old Testament talks about Jeremiah, Isaiah, Elijah, Moses. Moses, who was even by his own people persecuted and mocked and made fun of and belittled in his, by his own people. Then the New Testament, you have Peter and, and Paul and Andrew. Peter, Peter was crucified, but he is crucified upside down because he, he didn't feel right being crucified the same way Jesus was. You have Paul who was beheaded. You have Andrew who was crucified. Thomas who was pierced with a sword. Philip, Matthew, Bartholomew, James, on and on and on. The New Testament is full of people that were persecuted. And I think about you and I, sometimes we just, we just whine and complain about the, the simple little oust that we have with somebody or something. I, I just read about martyrs, and oh my gosh, you guys, if you get a chance and you need your faith to be challenged, just start Googling martyrs for Christianity. And there are so many people that, that, that weren't ashamed that when it came down to it, would they deny their faith? No, they wouldn't. Would they deny their Jesus? No, they wouldn't. I read about three men in the 1950s that, that were actually, in fact, when they faced the opposition, the persecution to death, they rejoiced and were exceedingly glad. I'm going to just tell you about him real quickly, okay? The first one is George Roper. And this, this man was a younger man of the three. Um, he was courageous and complex, and, and Roger, at his coming to the stake, did this. He put off his own gown, and he, he fetched a great leap. So soon as the flame was about to get him, he was burnt at the stake. Think about that. Um, he said that, they said that Roger put out both of his arms from his body and so stood steadfast, continuing in that matter, not plucking his arms in till the fire had consumed them and burnt them off. I can't even fathom. I'm afraid of my own heart. I'm afraid that I would be like, okay, 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 get me out of here. I'd like to think that I don't. And every day is a challenge when I face opposition. Like, what am I going to do if it comes down to that? The second man is Lawrence Saunders, who with a smiling face embraced the stake of his execution and kissed it, saying, welcome to the cross of Christ. Welcome everlasting life. Another man was Dr. Taylor. Says that he leapt and danced a little as he came to his execution saying, when asked how he was, this is what he answered. Well, God be praised, good master sheriff. Never better, for now I am almost home. I am even at my father's house. We've got to become more heavenly minded and realize that this time on earth is very temporary and very short, and we have eternity to gain for it. Um, I have a friend that, that he hasn't, suffered persecution to the point of, of death. But he was telling me that as he's grown in his faith, um, he's been a Christian for a number of years, but has recently just started to really grow in his faith that at his job, he has felt like he's not supposed to be part of the coarse joking anymore and the gossiping and the belittling and, and that kind of conversation that doesn't set him apart. It only makes him identify with the people he's with. And he's realizing that God's called him to be set apart. So he said he, he's on the oust. He said it's a weird feeling because he's used to being the one in the in crowd, looking at those on the outside. But now he's the one on the outside, looking at them on the inside. And he said, I'm not sorry for that. And I don't feel left out. He said, it's just different. And maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe you're at a place in your faith journey where God's calling you to, to look different than the people you're around, to look different at your workplace, not in a prideful, arrogant way, but in a way of humility, in a way that says that person's different. What's different about them? You shouldn't, you shouldn't really ever have to tell anybody that you're a Christian. They should be able to see it and wonder what makes you so different. But if you and I are, are looking similar to everybody else, it's hard to be called apart. It's hard to, 
to know what, what's different about us. And I think for my friend at his, at his workplace, I think that, that when, uh, when one of his coworkers is probably going to go through a hard time, because that's life, right? We all go through those, that perhaps they're going to seek him out and say, what's, what's different about you? What's, what's made you stand firm in the middle of, of all the malicious talk and all the bad things going on that we say and do and that sort of stuff? I think he's going to be able to shine bright. Just like Paul and Silas were when they were thrown in jail, they were able to shine bright and share the gospel. There was a reward that happened. So you and I have to remember that we're part of a a body of believers that has gone before us. They created the first church for us. They paid their lives for us. And we get to continue the journey with them. So we got to remember that we're different, that we should not be afraid or surprised by the persecution that we face. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. We have something to stand up for. We have something to be brave about. So remember, we don't need to seek persecution, nor are we to instigate persecution for the sake of arguing. It will find us. Those of us that are followers, it will find us. And know that we're in great company because we're going to remember who's gone before us. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It may look different for each of us, but we will all suffer persecution. And Jesus was pretty clear about it, that we'll face it one way or another. And he's also pretty clear about the fact that we should stick together as a body of believers. We sure don't need to be the ones bringing persecution into the church. So as I prayed about sharing with you today, um, this was something that I really felt that I needed to say. It's, it's, it's part of being persecuted, and it's part of where the Church of Christ is at right now with all of the unsettling that we have been through, all of the unrest that we have been through, um, all the criticism that is going on out in the world in politics, in COVID, in all of that. Um, we as believers, sadly, have brought it into the family of Christ, the family of God, the body of believers. And we have begun to be critical of each other. We have begun to um, do some of the things that our text text of Scripture talks about, uh, persecute each other, lie about them, say all sorts of evil things. Um, We've started to do that here in our family. And I just really want to encourage you, that's that's not what God has for us. If, If there's ever a a time for the family of God to love one another and to stand together, it's now. So if you're part of Southridge, as one of your pastors, I'm going to encourage you, put away the malicious talk. Put away the chattering against each other in our body, against leaders in our body. Just, just lay it aside. And if you're part of another church family, I encourage you to do the same thing. Love the people that are in your body of believers, in your family of God, because we're only as strong as we can be together. We have a whole world out there that we get to reach, that we get to love, that doesn't see Christianity like we do. So we need to stick together so that we can be one and stronger together. I'm going to close with a scripture here before we pray, and it's it's again in the message version. It's Romans 14, and it it says, uh, I don't think I put it up on the screen. Okay. I'm going to read it slow. You get a chance to read it later. It it, it was actually just shared with me this week in my life group by by my life group leader. And it just really strung a chord in my heart regarding this. And it says this, Romans 14, 10 through 12. So where does that leave you when you criticize a brother? And where does that leave you when you condescend a sister? I'd say it leaves you looking pretty silly or worse. Eventually, we're all going to end up kneeling side by side in the place of judgment facing God. Your critical and condescending ways aren't going to improve your position there one bit. Read it for yourself in Scripture. As I live and breathe, God says, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will tell the honest truth that I and only I am God. We're on the same side, church family. We're in this together. And this is a time, it's never been harder for churches 
whatever church family you're part of, stick together because we're all part of the greater body of Christ. We need each other. So two things. Don't be surprised by persecution. Remember this, be happy and skip like a lamb. That, that just went through my head these last two weeks. I'm going to skip like a lamb. So anytime somebody says anything about <laughs> how I'm loving somebody or doing something, you know what, I'm just, in my head, I'm just skipping like a lamb, skipping like a lamb. So be happy when you face persecution. And the second thing is don't bring persecution into the church. Let's guard each other. Let's protect each other. Let's win this battle together so that we don't see our brothers and sisters fall to the wayside because we've been critical to each other. Okay? All right. I hope you still love me after this. Um, let me pray real quick, and, and then we'll, we'll let, the, let them close this off. All right. Father, we, uh, we thank you that your word is, it is sharper than a two-edged sword, and I thank you for that. I thank you that it's truth, that it brings life to us. Your truth is full of love, um, and your truth is full of truth. And sometimes that does hurt. Sometimes it steps on our toes. But I know it's because you love us that you write these things in here. So God, I pray that any of my friends on the other side of this are, are facing any kind of persecution. I pray for them, God. I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray that you would give them courage to be brave. I pray that they would remember that there are so many other believers that have gone before them that have faced some of the same situations they're facing. And I pray that they would keep their eyes on the reward that maybe, just maybe, you're going to open up a door for them to see lives changed around them. And I pray that, Father, you would keep them, God, doing the right thing, the righteous thing, that they would not grow weary, God. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.